All right, welcome to another episode of Freight FM, episode 10, all things West Coast in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, my name is Emily Smith. I work in the marketing department here at Interlog, and today I'm joined by a colleague of mine, Perry. Perry, Hello. welcome. Hi, Emily. I'm, uh, I also work with Emily in the marketing department, and uh, yeah, looking forward to dissecting this. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about, honestly. I feel like it could go on for so long, but we'll kind of keep it brief and pretty informative and just talk about what's happening, what's currently happening, um, any updates we've seen, where this all kind of started, any impacts um, this may have on shippers and more. Um, so kind of to start things off, Harry, um, on the U.S. side of things, they they reach, uh, recently reached uh, the dock uh, dock workers recently reached a tentative agreement mm -hmm. um, with the Pacific Maritime Association. Can you tell us kind of how this all started and where it's kind of at now? Yeah, so we're going to have to go pretty far back, <laughs> um, wind back the clock because the talks were around fourteen months. So they began officially back in May of last year, May of twenty twenty two. Um, particularly May 10th, um, and leading up, the months leading up to the talks were sort of dreaded. There is certainly a looming anxiety over the industry, uh, mainly because the last talks in 2014, um, they ended up stalling out for nine months. So this wasn't, it was sort of expected that there was going to be some sort of stall to these, um, albeit we weren't expecting it to be 14 months, but you could sort of go into the talks. Everyone, when May came around last year, you were like, okay, here we start. And uh, that, the one in 2014 actually had to be brokered by the uh, Obama administration. I so, just remember seeing that in the news, yeah. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I don't remember, if, I was pretty young, I was in high school actually, but I remember there were some supply chain delays back then. Yeah, that, so, a bit, of, I was around that age too, so I, I didn't see too much about it, but just learning about it with this happening now, it's yeah. been interesting to kind of compare those two. Right. As well. Yeah. So, like, we knew that there's the potential for disruptions from this. And then you couple that as we're 2022, as wild as that was, that sort of amplified the impacts. Um, but uh, not to, <laughs> you could talk all day about <laughs> all this, but uh, going in past May, um, there was about a two month window. Um, before the previous contract, the one that was reached in 2014, um, expired, uh, it expired July 1st. Yes. And uh, there was no no contract made. In fact, the two sides, uh, the PMA and ILWU, um, they actually uh, had a, they called for a break. I believe that was in June, June yeah. 2022, mm -hmm. right kind of before um, in July, the negotiations kind of ended. Or right. it was, where the contract, I'm sorry, kind of ended and mm -hmm. negotiations kind of began again. Yeah, so that was sort of like, okay, wow, this was sort of, at least from our understanding of things, it seemed like kind of a reality check that, okay, there's going to be something here, um, a lot of issues here that they need to mend. And ultimately what those issues revealed to be were uh, automation, um, wages, and uh, this one, we can talk about this when we get to Canada more, if it's, that seems to be more of an issue there. But there's also an issue about contracting out uh, work and sort of this, um, I don't want to say job insecurity, but this, uh, this fear that you may, that your job may not, that your role, you may not have another role in a certain part of the port or particularly with like when things expand and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, all throughout 2022, the contract was still stalling on, um, closed off to the media, right Emily? Yes, so. they, they would, I know like the PMA and the ILWU did release like some statements mm -hmm. throughout this entire like negotiation process. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of still like speculation and, um, and stuff like that. Though I, one of the bigger kind of things back in October during negotiations, those were kind of suspended because there 
there was reports of a dispute at a Seattle Marine terminal and some dock worker job actions kind of taking place there. And while that was a temporary thing, you know, little things like that uh, occurred during this entire, uh, entire kind of um, negotiation mm -hmm. process until they reached that tentative agreement. Um, but also before I kind of uh, like finish up the kind of timeline of this um, contract negotiation process, can you talk more maybe a little mm -hmm. bit about the kind of shift in cargo that occurred? Sure, yeah. And that's, uh, I'd say that was the legacy of these talks. Um, I think it's funny within such a short amount of time with the uh, Canada ones, which we'll cover when those started, um, but they started pretty relatively recently. Um, we we're already seen a strike, uh, a strike of this magnitude, the one we're seeing in Canada never occurred on the West coast, on the yeah. U S West coast. Um, but the anxiety shippers, you would have thought there was like doomsday on the West coast. Cause yeah. as Emily's pointing out, there's a lot of, uh, diversion of, uh, cargo that originally is sent to the West coast. Um, but shippers were like, well, you know, this, we're not going to deal with that. Like there's a lot of uncertainty and they weren't, they were afraid there was going to be like strikes or some sort of job related actions. Um, so they would shift the cargo to the East and Gulf coast. Um, in fact, I remember we touched on this in our newsletters at the time, but back in September and maybe October as well, New York was actually, um, led, uh, all ports in this country in throughput, which yeah. I don't know when was the last time that has, but it's typically LA and Long Beach. So. Yeah. And like for the entire, I there was a stat last year that uh, for the entire year of 2022, that the port of LA still remained the top port, but mm -hmm. like the port of um, New York and New Jersey was number two. So they were definitely climbing their, their, their way through these things as well. Um, so that was kind of interesting to see. I think a lot of shippers, what I don't think a lot moved their entire like set of cargo. I think some were kind of using this as a good option to move some of it and see just to make sure that they prepared themselves with different options, you know, cause things, things definitely come up in this industry that I don't know, things change on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. just a good way to be prepared, um, and stuff, but to kind of conclude this whole um, negotiation process, things kind of increased and talks got, uh, I don't know what the right word is, just increased, I guess, in April, um, where there were some reports of like a tentative agreement was reached on the topic of automation. Mm -hmm. So how th did that kind of go? And then can you just conclude how the, where the yeah. negotiations are now? Right. Yeah. That in fact, to my knowledge, too, with that, the uh, it was the union, right? That mm -hmm. it wasn't a joint statement, which with the uh, before with the media, it usually was both parties releasing like a joint statement. Yeah. Um, but with this one, uh, the union, um, the ILWU, uh, <laughs> they <laughs> mouthful, they uh, yeah, they released a statement saying that they certain. Uh, a tentative agreement has been reached on the issue of automation, which going into the talks, obviously wages were important, um, as well as the other issues we alluded to, but, uh, automation seemed like it was at least the most talked about, um, mm -hmm. within circles about, uh, just sort of the future going forward with that and how the unions were going to, um, just how this, how the contract moving forward would sort of work around that uh, issue. And, um, yeah, they announced that in April, which to us, so it's like, oh, wow, they cleared this big stumbling block. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, to wrap things up, I guess, uh, it wasn't until, uh, it took a few months longer. Um, and then by the time June came, um, we reached a tentative agreement. Um, and Emily, uh, when they say tentative too, uh, that doesn't mean fully agreed upon, right? Yes. So like they're still in the ratifying stage of this and they, I've read some things where it can take a month, but they have kind of been saying it could take a little bit longer than a month too. So the tentative agreement was reached on June 14th and we're so we're either we're approaching that one month period for that. So I could expect it maybe in the like next month or two, mm -hmm. but you never know with those kind of a things. 
But. Yeah, and uh, quickly too, like it, from what we've read as well, it's, uh, it is lengthy. Like they say it could take three months, but I don't, no one really is expecting any sort of, uh, any sort of backlash or any yeah. sort of continued friction with it. Yes. Um, it seems more of just a formality at this point. Yes. So to kind of move on to the Canadian side of things, right now, dock workers, the ILWU Canada dock workers, um, have been going on strike since July 1st. And so them and the BCMEA, the British Columbia um, Maritime Employers Association, I believe, they have failed to reach a resolution on their new contract, um, which their contract ended March 31st of this year. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us a little bit more about this, kind of yeah. what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, these talks, yeah, they weren't going on as long as uh, the West Coast. They didn't start at the same time. Um, these started, the talks, from what I've read, they began in February. Um, yeah. Leading up, and as Emily pointed out, the contract expired at the end of March. Um, and from then, uh, there were sort of, at least in our corner of the industry, whisperings of these talks occurring um, throughout the past uh, summer, or early spring, I guess. Um, but we were so preoccupied with the U.S. West Coast, uh, you know, you're like, oh, you know, up north, they're, they're, uh, they're also having negotiations. It just wasn't as, you know, we deemed it more urgent on the West Coast, on the U.S. West Coast, just because those were heating up. Um, and ultimately, uh, once the tender agreement was reached on the U.S., uh, we're like, oh, yay, like, this is awesome. Uh, you know, peak season, whatever peak season may be, that's a whole different podcast episode. But uh, it's saved, and we don't have to worry about uh, the West Coast being hampered with potential supply chain disruption. And then it's like, well, wait, we got um, Illu Canada here mm -hmm. and uh, and there's this uh, stalling negotiation up to the north here. And uh, July 1st was when, uh, I guess, you know, when the Pandora's box was opened. Um, as we pointed to before, US West Coast saw some little job related actions and you mentioned the terminal dispute in yeah. Seattle, but uh, ultimately there wasn't ever a widespread uh, public strike mm -hmm. like the one that's occurring up at Vancouver and Prince Rupert ports. Um, but, and, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. I was just going to say, and not to say that there isn't any impact to those that like it can impact shippers in the U.S. too, because a lot of people like ship to Vancouver, and then it gets sent by rail to uh, Chicago is a big like main inland hub. So there are like some impacts on that side. What have you been kind of seeing regarding yeah, the impacts? Certainly uh, the rail side, mm -hmm. um, as you bring up, uh, it's true. Uh, Vancouver, particularly, uh, it makes up a good chunk of uh, American trade. Uh, I saw like uh, the, there's like a percentage of 15% of mm -hmm. container trade that moves through the port of Vancouver is destined to the U.S. That was per report by CNBC. Right. Okay. And they talked about it on like the Prince Rupert side of things too, how two thirds of containerized import volumes that come into that port are destined to the U.S. Mm -hmm. via rail. So it does play like People in the U.S. still need to be concerned about this, or just be aware of mm -hmm. what's happening out there too. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and rail too is very um, it's just crucial there, uh, especially because when you get on the West Coast, it seems like rail is a lot more preferred, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for intermodal, intermodal and all that. Um, so you know, that said. Uh, you know, the rail, like it's very well integrated, rail is very well integrated into Vancouver um, and any sort of, you know, any sort of, when that network sprayed a little bit, um, you know, you can create, uh, I mean, you can grind it, the, grind it to a halt essentially. And um, that, the issue too with what I've seen with rail, Emily, it has been like, it just hasn't, for every day the strike goes on, um, 
you know, you, you're going to have to count for maybe a couple of days of recovery for it. Yeah, I was seeing something how it can take three to five days to kind mm-hmm. of recover from that and what we're on like day 12 right. of the strike. So, mm-hmm. you know, it that those delays can play a part and it impacts some of those major railroads too, like Canadian Pacific, Canadian National, and BN, BNSF. Mm-hmm. Those are some of those main ones that are out there. Um, so that plays a big part too, but it's also interesting to kind of see, like, I've just kind of been hearing, like, what would it take to get the union back to work if they don't reach, like, a labor deal? And so what's kind of interesting is they would, um, some people are calling on the Canadian um, government to call the Canadian parliament um, in session, because right now it's like their summer break. Mm-hmm. But if it's recalled, it would take several days for um, them to get in there. And then they like in order for a vote to be legal, um, there needs to be a minimum a m- number of members in an assembly that must be present in order for that to be valid. Mm-hmm. And also there's, you know, pros and cons of going about it this yeah. way. Some so people. they could essentially, if they all vote in favor, like call, like recall the strike. Or like would essentially um if like the parliament voted to for the union to go back to work then mm-hmm. less strike would be no more and mm-hmm. they would be required to um go to work but that in itself has different implications too yeah. it's a whole it's a whole thing we don't Can't need to go down me. that yeah. road but good for morale, so. yeah so it's there's just like a lot going on but as we kind of like wrap this up here too i i do kind of want to hear your thoughts on kind of like the difference between these negotiations that are happening Mm. out in Canada and the negotiations that occurred on the U.S. West Coast. Yeah. Um, I would say as far as the direct negotiations go, like the inside, um, I didn't really know exactly how the sausage was made inside (laughs) of the the debate room. But uh, I would say as far as impacts go, um, this one in Vancouver, or uh, the Canada, uh, the one occurring in Canada right now, um, it seems like, well, like it just swiftly hit, like yeah. you, we instantly realized, wow, like these are the impacts here of, uh, you know, if, well, if something stinky hits the pan, sort of like if some sort of disruptive action, you know, like a strike occurs, um, you know, big ports like Vancouver or on the U S West coast case, um, you know, Long Beach, LA, like, uh, you know, these, these workers are the backbone of the ports operations. So if you remove them, um, clearly, you know, the supply chains are going to take a hit. Um, you know, luckily, uh, during the U S West coast, we, you know, that wasn't the guinea pig. We didn't have to see, Oh, what would that mean? Like, what would that do to, to everyone's supply chain? But, uh, but the one right now we're seeing Vancouver and Prince Rupert, um, at this point it's, it's unraveling here, and uh, I'd say what I'm interested in watching to now, when looking at both of these, just how how will the mediation efforts play out? Um, I've heard that uh, secretaries, uh, the labor secretary uh, Sue was in Canada. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, yeah. I heard that too. Yeah, yeah, and she was uh, both. Back at the U.S. West Coast, uh, both the IW or ILWU and the PMA said that she was uh, instrumental in reaching a deal. So, sounds like uh, Emily, the article you're referring to with the um, with the Ministry of Labor in Canada making progress. Um, I think that could be uh, crucial there. Uh, just hearing how, you know, can they somehow put together a deal that's favorable to both sides? Um, and ultimately, what the U.S. West Coast one I felt like came down to was the urgency of a uh, of, of potential peak season, um, making sure a contract was squared away before a cargo rush possibly came in. Because, one, like the union, say if there was a cargo rush, um, well, first off, the port would lose out on a profitable season. Um, so that, obviously, they don't want their wallet to hurt. But uh, for the union... Um, they also don't want to be the scapegoat. They don't want to look like the bad guy. Like, hey, you know, you guys were the ones dragging this on while, you know, the supply chain was disrupted during a peak season. So it's sort of, you know, the urgency there too could be a factor. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately sort of those two things is 
what I've taken from the West U.S. West Coast and sort of applying it to uh, Vancouver. Yeah. But. No, I definitely agree. It's it's all very interesting, and you know, who knows? By tomorrow, next week, there could be a resolution to all of this too. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just how quickly things change, or sometimes things don't change so quickly in this industry. Yeah. But um, before we head out here, Harry, any last thoughts on, on this or anything? Uh, I, I guess I'll just end up with, I agree with your point. It's, um, I remember, at least I was very surprised when the U.S. West Coast mm -hmm. kind of agreement was reached, uh, just because days leading up to that, um, Remember those job actions, or yes. like not strikes, but um, just like I, our workers um, skipping shifts or some sort of, I guess it was more of, uh, yeah, just little job actions, but you were like, oh, is this sort of, you know, is the seal going to break here? Mm -hmm. um, and the next thing you know, they reached a deal. Yeah. So uh, I uh, I agree with you there where, you know, by the time this podcast episode goes out, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe they reached. But, uh, yeah. You never know, but... <laughs> Thanks for um, listening and joining us on this conversation. It uh, was a great episode. Um, if there, if you guys have any questions, comments, you can definitely reach out to us. Um, and hope you enjoyed the next one, and, or hope you enjoyed this one, and um, hope you'll join us on our next episode.